On the December 18th of last year, a Russian prisoner was advised he would be sent to a different jail. He was handcuffed and led instead to a chartered American, uh, to a chartered Aeroflot jet. Uh, his guard released the handcuffs made in the United States, American businessmen will be proud to hear, uh, only after the airplane had left Soviet airspace. Uh, then Mr. Bukowski was told what had happened. He was being released from jail in reply to the initiative of General Pinochet of Chile. Uh, Pinochet's deal will release the communist Corvalan, you release the de Santa Bukowski. Uh, two months later, Mr. Bukowski was visiting in the White House. The purpose of this discussion, in addition to the obvious celebration of human heroism, uh, is to get from Mr. Bukowski such insights as he may have developed into the mood of the West and its leaders respecting the question of human rights as an objective of foreign policy. Uh, Vladimir Bukovsky was born in 1942 in East Russia and was expelled from Moscow University where he studied biophysics for the offense of publishing a satirical journal. Uh, two years later, he was arrested for distributing copies of the new class by Yugoslav dissident Milovan Zilas. At the famous Lubyanka prison, he read English grammar books. During the next 14 years, he was mostly in Soviet insane asylums, which is where the densest collection of Soviet heroes nowadays herded. There are 400,000 births in Russia's insane asylums, 27 square feet per person. Mr. Bukowski endured the years of hell, and his name came gradually into prominence in the West. His meeting with President Carter was a milestone, not, one hopes, the high watermark of the Western crusade for human rights. He is here and will from time to time, as required, ask uh, his associate, Mr. Telnikov, uh, for assistance. The examiner today is Mr. Andrew Knight, the editor of The Economist, often referred to as the most influential uh, English journal uh, in, in the world. Mr. Knight, who has appeared several times on this program, is a graduate of Ampleforth, and of Balliol uh, College in Oxford, where he studied economics and political theory. Uh, he became editor of The Economist in October of 1974. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Bukowski, what is his response to the statement by Brezhnev that the United States is interfering in Soviet domestic affairs by addressing its, uh, itself to the problem of human rights? Well, I think that the problem of human rights is an international problem and cannot be regarded like uh, just pure domestic affair of any country, especially now after the signing of uh, Helsinki Accord, which maybe for the first time in the history of international relations puts this problem as an uh, international one and uh, now any fear, any violation of human rights in countries, signatories of this accord, uh, have to be regarded as a violation of international treaty, international accord. Then we cannot regard any of such happening as a purely domestic affair. Well, let, 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 let me begin, if I may, by congratulating you on your mastery of English. Your, your nervousness before the program was, was certainly un unwarranted. Well, uh, uh, granted, this is the construction that you put on it, but the official Soviet construction of the Helsinki uh, Accord uh, is that uh, each nation uh, pledges itself to a certain behavior, but that it is exclusively up to a country's own government to decide whether it is in violation of that behavior. How do you respond to that argument? I think it's out of international, <coughs> out of international practice. If two sides signed any international treaty, 
both of them are up to uh, estimate whether it is violated or fulfilled in any of these countries. Otherwise, it's impossible to observe, uh, impossible to judge whether sides fulfill this accord or not. Uh, for example, if two sides decided under the SALT agreement to reduce their armament or anything like that, uh, I'm sure both sides have to evaluate whether both sides do it or not. Otherwise, it's impossible to fulfill it or, or to monitor it. Uh, well, uh, in, in, in monitoring Soviet uh, compliance with the, dif with the disarmament, or, or rather with the, uh, with the um, strategic weapons treaties, we never have uh, relied on internal Soviet discipline, have we? We have relied rather on our capacity to detect violations through, uh, uh, through an instrumentation that we control, our own satellites. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Helsinki Pact, we are asking the Soviet Union to use its own sanctions to suppress its own behavior. Now, from your experience with the Soviet Union, is this entirely quixotic, r r romantic, I'm not sure I'm... Uh, well, I'm is, it, is, it, uh, yeah, is, it, is it ridiculous to assume hmm. that we can appeal to any authority within the Soviet Union hmm. to force it to enforce, to, to require to enforce the provisions of the Helsinki Pact? Or is it something that the outside world has to enforce on it? Oh, I'm absolutely sure that... Uh, Soviet authorities would never fulfill their obligations under this accord on their own. They never had such idea from the beginning, just from the start of these negotiations in Helsinki and around it. And uh, just from the beginning, they had such provision in mind, such a uh, loophole as so-called interference in internal affairs, just to justify themselves of any violation of this accord. And uh, it is completely in the line of their practice and their uh, dictatorial essence to violate human rights. And uh, I'm afraid they cannot exist without such violations. That's why uh, any accord, any agreement, which uh, supposed uh, to be, to, to rely completely on their goodwill would be nonsense. All right, in, in, under the circumstances, since you agree that to appeal to the uh, good nature, if you like, or to, uh, to uh, any sense of institutional obligations isn't going to be sufficient, what, would, what are you urging on the West by way of external sanctions applied to the Soviet Union? What do you want us to do? Well, apart from normal practice in United Nations organization where they have their own sanctions, uh, apart from it, the Helsinki Accord itself, uh, in, in its structure, has three baskets, first, second, and third. And uh, from the beginning, it was uh, presumed then a full, uh, all, all those three baskets have to be fulfilled and uh, it, it is out of agreement, would be out of agreement, if one of these baskets only would be fulfilled. You mean your point is that um, insofar as, bas as the provisions of basket three are not complied with, yeah. we are entitled to say that our obligations under baskets one and two uh, are uh, rescinded? Yes, I think so, because uh, from the beginning, from the very moment of these negotiations, it was put like it, that all of these baskets <coughs> are linked between them, and uh, we can, uh, and the sides of these negotiations were prepared to fulfill the, them only on the, uh, on, the f on the basis of full number, full number of these baskets put in, into practice. What, what would be the effect 
of our taking that position? What would be the effect on Soviet policy? Well, uh, I suppose that uh, Soviet authorities are very anxious to have uh, some economic, technological help and support from outside, from from free world, because they cannot achieve some level of some technological level on their own, and. Uh, that was the main reason why they started all these negotiations, uh, to make it more easy for them to have an access to the scientific achieve achievements and economic help, and economic funds, loans. Uh, and just because it was a main point for them, I'm sure that the very firm position of Western countries would force them to fulfill all three baskets, not only one or two. Well, the, um, their desire for technological help mm -hmm. and their desire for economic help does not flow in naturally from baskets one and two. The, this, this is a, a, an entirely different bargaining matter. But uh, to see if I understand you, are you saying to me that if the West declined to give them economic credits or technological help, it would have the effect of forcing them to comply with the provisions of basket three? Yes, I think so. You think so? Yeah. Well, uh, if that were to happen, would the government in the Soviet Union be endangered? That is to say, if you had freedom for dissenters in the Soviet Union, would it inescapably follow that the authority and the security of the governors of the Soviet Union would be jeopardized? Well, uh, I think we have to uh, divide two things, uh, security of the state, security of the nation as a whole, or security of the regime and its present shape. Of course, they, they would be obliged to change some restrictions, some sides of their regime, make it m uh, not so oppressive as it now, be more tol tolerant to people with different opinions. That's what they would be obliged to change in their system. And I cannot say it in any way endanger the state security as, as itself. Well, uh, so state security is not necessarily the same thing as the security of the Politburo, is it? Yes, of course. Is it? Yes, I think so. It's not the same. Uh, well, no, I, uh, I agree with you that it, it's, it's not the same, but uh, surely there must be a reason other than that uh, 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 that they're more comfortable that way for suppressing dissent, isn't there? Why, do, why is Brezhnev afraid of you? One of the main pillars of their system is a lie. Mm -hmm. That's why they managed to survive in, the, in, in, in their present shape 60 or so years. Uh, and of course, they are very nervous, very anxious not to be disclosed to their own people and to the Western public opinion. Why? Uh, because it is the main pillar of their system, the lie. And uh, it would undermine uh, some some myths spread here and inside of the Soviet Union. Well, if you, undermine, if you undermine those myths, mm -hmm. would it follow that their authority and their government would collapse? No, I cannot say so. They uh, would have a more serious pressure from Beniz to change, to let people more freedom, more, uh, more possibilities, better life conditions and other things. It can start a more uh, eager struggle for human rights, for social rights, for national rights inside of Soviet Union, and they would be obliged to back down. And it wouldn't necessarily require, a, uh, re require suicide on their part. Uh, they, maybe they would simply modify. Uh, maybe in the long run, I don't know, but uh, not immediately, and uh, they have uh, 
uh, a lot of possibilities to change themselves, to adjust themselves for the health and care accord or demands of fulfillment of human rights. Uh, in any ways, it is, it is not uh, the suicide for them. It is not the problem of uh, existence of regime as a, as a whole. It is just the problem of adjustment of it. When, when, uh, when you arrived uh, in the United S when, when you arrived in, in Great Britain, mm. uh, actually in Switzerland, uh, in, the, in the ensuing weeks and months, were you encouraged or not encouraged by your experience with Western determination to help the dissidents in the Soviet Union? Yes, it's uh, what I did since then. I tried to help them, and sometimes we achieved uh, real victories. No, but, but do, did, you, did you find that... Uh, I know that Solzhenitsyn, for instance, was very discouraged. After he had spent a few months uh, in the West, he concluded that uh, the anxiety to help the Soviet Union's dissidents uh, was, uh, was at best... Uh, was at best um, uh, uh, irresolute. I was wondering whether you had the simu uh, a similar experience, well, or whether I'm you f found a considerable determination here. Whether I found considerable determination in the Western people or Western governments, you mean? Uh, as far as I know, the Western governments, most of them, are not uh, prepared to defend their own standpoint, to insist on real fulfillment of treaties, agreements, and uh, other international laws. Why? Uh, well, uh, they have some wrong standpoint. They have some uh, erroneous understanding of uh, Soviet system. Some of them, and it's very frequent, I can admit it in, in the press, in England, in, in the United States, such a viewpoint that the uh, uh, Western side have to be more, more weak, more soft with Soviet Union, not to make them angry, to have some achievement in negotiations. It is completely wrong. It is rubbish. As far as I know, the more they weak, the more they would have Soviet side firm and demanding. And what they did, actually, uh, under the detente policy, made them uh, very hard opponents of, out of Soviet Union. They would have... Uh, very difficult time in any sort of negotiations out after it. Uh, and it's completely their fault uh, because for the Soviet side, a weakness is just a manifestation, uh, a softness, a manifestation of weakness. Uh, they cannot understand it's just a willingness of good relations and negotiations and that thing. That was completely wrong. And uh, as speaking about public opinion here and people, in Western countries. Uh, I'm more optimistic. I found a lot of uh, people who really sympath sympathize and try to help us and did actually a great deal to help us. Unfortunately, this public opinion is not reflected on a um, policy line of so many governments in Germany, in France, where, as you uh, maybe remember, uh, during the visit of Brezhnev to Paris. Uh, I can say, I was just in that time in Paris, I can say that all political parties were very angry with the president of France just because his very um, undignified position and readiness to make any concessions to Mr. Brezhnev, never, um, never trying to support people oppressed in Soviet Union and other countries. Uh, of course, such a line is not, I can say, it is not a reflection of uh, public opinion here. It is just... Uh, You're here meaning Great Britain? Yes. Uh, uh, in Great Britain, it's more complicated because of uh, some sort of special relation between the United States and England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, uh, really, I don't believe in their sincerity here. The government of Great Britain uh, didn't help till now our movement in open way. They made some allusions on uh, 
other attempts to help us in a clandestine way in some uh, secret negotiations. But uh, I think it is just pretext, it's just self-justification, uh, because nobody can check it up. And another thing, for Soviet Union, for Soviet authorities, uh, real, really uh, an argument is when it is spoken openly. Any sort of secret negotiations is not influential for them. Well, now, what, what, is the, what is the best way by which non-government people can help the Soviet dissident uh, movement? You say that you run into a lot of encouragement here. What form does it take? Is it letters to, uh, to the prime minister? Is it letters to uh, the New York Times? Is it rallies? Uh, is it uh, financial aid? What, what form does objective help take? Well, I think it's all forms of help. And uh, let me take one example. As, as you mentioned, I was, uh, last time I was in prison just because of uh, my protest against uh, psychiatric abuse in the Soviet Union. And uh, just after it, and it's a very suggestive example, just after it, uh, a lot of psychiatrists, and especially in England, a Royal College of Psychiatry, and in other countries, started a campaign against psychiatric abuse in the Soviet Union. Uh, at the end of the year, I was arrested. They had plan of uh, some sort of international gathering of psychiatrists in uh, Mexico. And uh, top politics and uh, top people of this Congress decided not to make Soviet side very angry and just uh, cool down this question and they didn't discuss in Mexico. Just because of it, the situation in Soviet Union aggravated. Uh, uh, it did what? Aggravated. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, the psychiatric abuse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was put in prison for 12 years <laughs> just because nobody helped, really, in, uh, in a public scene outside. And it created a lot of bitter feelings inside of Soviet Union and outside. But uh, public opinion and public forces here really saved the situation because they built up a tremendous campaign against psych psychiatric abuse. They forced so many political bodies or politicians to speak out openly about it. And now, as you know, not only my personal case, my personal release, but uh, I can say that uh, the number of people who put in psychiatric asylum in Soviet Union on political uh, reasons, uh, diminished greatly. And Soviet authorities are very uh, anxious uh, about this. And they are not so free, so, um, you know, free-handed to do it. And it's not so easy for them now. And uh, as far as, uh, just as far as people are known outside of Soviet Union, Right. They he, couldn't put them to psychiatric asylum. So that you consider that uh, one, one of your responsibilities is to make known the names of the people who are suffering as you That's did. And of course, this was the reason why you were detected and sent back hmm. uh, after you were released the second time. Now, is there, is there a public apparatus or a semi-public apparatus for bringing to uh, the attention of the West, the names of victims of this execution. <coughs> how, how, if, if somebody were arrested tomorrow and put in one of these insane asylums, how would you learn about it or would you learn about it? I think I would, and uh, mostly due to my friends in Moscow and other places in the Soviet see. Union who would inform uh, foreign journalists and what would you do um, with the name? With, with, whom, with whom would you register that information? With oh, Am Amnesty International? Or? Not only, not only. The Am Amnesty International uh, was one time of great help for us, but now we have uh, special organizations. For example, here in this country, Campaign Against Psychiatric Abuse. Uh, it is, uh, how to say, some society, some public body, which consists of psychiatrists, uh, laymen or juries and other people who are very active in defense of such victims of psychiatric abuse in the Soviet Union. 
And uh, they, they made different things. They made rallies, meetings, demonstrations, petitions. They uh, lobbied psychiatrists. Uh, they managed to get uh, some resolutions of different psychiatric associations across the world. And other things, distribute the information freely for the press, for the just for for the public. The the objective was to get professional denunciations yes, of course. that activity. Yes. And uh, as I understand it, they failed at two world congresses of the Scottish, but they may very well succeed in the next one. Is that correct? Well, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Just now, this summer, have to be another one congress right. in Honolulu. Are you going? Not no, I cannot. I am not psychiat a psychiatrist myself. But you can give testimony, can't you? Uh, well, I wasn't asked to yes. do it. Uh, they have a lot of testimonies now, just a uh, full file of it, and they are ready to discuss it now. Well, let me ask you this. Um, wh what is it that attracted these Soviet apparatus to the device of um, psychiatric uh, uh, hospitals for dealing with dissidents? Why didn't they just simply ship them out as they had been used to doing to Gulag? Well, uh, I think it's just because the Soviet system has changed, slowly but changed. Uh, under Stalin times, they were very free to kill people by millions, mm -hmm. and the, now they cannot do it. Mostly, not because they are so humane, but because this terror uh, which they applied for their enemies from the beginning turned back to them uh, to themselves, mm -hmm. and they couldn't stop it. They, uh, they used it uh, in their internal fight, and managed to the end of Stalin time destroy three quarters of their own party. And one time they destroyed three thirds of their own party congress. Uh, then they had to stop it, and uh, I, I think they couldn't uh, launch it anymore uh, now. Uh, but they. They couldn't permit people to live according to their beliefs and opinion. But wh why did they have to have this psychiatric uh, 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 interval? Why, why didn't they simply, uh, if, they didn't, if they didn't want to kill you, why didn't they simply send you to Siberia for 10 years? Well, they did. <laughs> yes, I know. In your, in, yes. But that was after repeated provocation. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, it started under Khrushchev time. Mm -hmm. Khrushchev was very anxious not to be disposed, you know, not, not, not to be exposed to the public opinion, because he was a, a person who disclosed Stalin's crimes yeah. and was very eager to have a good image for mm -hmm. Soviet, uh, uh, for Soviet uh, state uh, and establish some good relations with other communist countries and parties, but could not uh, avoid some, some means of oppression. Uh, that's why he started it. Uh, they were sure from the beginning uh, that in this way nobody would guess about uh, a real reason of growth of psychiatric, uh, of mentally ill persons in the Soviet Union. Uh, they uh, thought uh, they could conceal it out of public uh, opinion. And another thing, it's very convenient for them. Uh, when, de uh, when they declare anybody as insane, uh, it denigrates not only him personally, but the views he expressed. Uh, and uh, it is more difficult to create some support inside country and outside. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people are very suspicious. They cannot say whether you are sane or not sane. You cannot persuade them just freely about everybody. We have a lot of insane people in any country who can commit crimes in the state. Uh, Speaking uh, simply, uh, I think uh, generally speaking, they uh, just try to make this matter more complicated for estimation, for support, for struggle against mm -hmm. it. Well, what, was there was there a sense uh, in in which they were attracted to the notion of insanity, on the assumption that any non-Marxist uh, was not. Uh, Oh, it was was un unnatural. It was not in rhythm with history. Is is no. that one of the reasons yes. uh, why they were attracted now, or was it cynical from the beginning? Did anybody ever think you were insane 
any competent psychiatrist or was it cynical from the beginning? Yeah, I think most of them were cynical. Mm -hmm. And for authorities, of course, it was a great problem of propaganda. Uh, just because, uh, because according to their uh, doctrine, Marxist doctrine, uh, in Soviet state, in Soviet Union, where, as they claim, they built socialism. Uh, it is impossible that uh, socialism, socialist society, created some people with non-socialist mentality. That's another problem for them. Because Mutations. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just because, because according to the Marxism or communist doctrine, uh, people's mind, people's conscience, created or shaped by conditions. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, they couldn't explain the appearance of people who fight against the system, or, for example, religious people. In a country where 60 years on end, they had, they had tremendous uh, atheistic propaganda, and churches destroyed, and uh, uh, one-time religion was forbid completely. Uh, that's uh, uh, no explanation in Marxist way why uh, people still believe in God or uh, opposed to socialism or communism. And the, explana the only explanation they could find, uh, no, strictly speaking, two explanations. One of them, it is external influence or subversive activity of international imperialism. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. But when they cannot prove it, when somebody like me, very young, who never saw capitalist society before, or had a, my parents communists, <laughs> without any external influence, then what? Then another explanation. Such persons are mentally ill. I see, I see, I see, I see. So, so in, in a sense, it's a rather orthodox explanation. Yeah. Isn't it? That's right, yes, that's right. Uh, now, do you predict that uh, this will be the technique the Soviet Union will continue to use towards its dissidents, or do you think that the technique ceases to be effective once it has been exposed the way you have exposed it? I'm afraid we cannot stop it immediately or uh, by one stroke. We have to be very vigilant. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that everybody who are well known to the Western public opinion, uh, they could not put freely to psychiatric asylum. But for so many people who are not so known outside, and uh, especially somewhere in province, and the rest of the media secretly, it is a great danger of being put into psychiatric asylum. And of course, uh, I'm sure that Soviet Union, Soviet authorities, wouldn't stop this practice. What we can do, actually, is just to be very vigilant and uh, watchful and expose every such case to the public opinion. We'll turn uh, ourselves over to the mercies of the examiner, Mr. Andrew Knight, the editor of The Economist. Mr. Knight. Mr. Bukowski, uh, it's been uh, very moving to have had you here and, even, uh, and to hear everything that you've said. A moment ago, you were saying that um, you're very young and you'd never seen capitalism before. and uh, the Soviets felt that this was a threat that somebody of your age, um, not having seen capitalism, should uh, insanely, in their view, uh, uh, find the society that they are carving out for themselves uh, unpalatable. Now you've been here in the West, a very welcome guest, I may say, um, but you're a Russian. How do you find that we measure up? Here you are in Britain now. Do you think that our society is healthy from the little you've seen, remembering what Bill Buckley said, for example, about the early impressions of Solzhenitsyn after he had been here, and the great disappointment that Solzhenitsyn felt with some of the values of Western society? How do you find our society here? Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I'm afraid I'm not the best judge now, because all my meetings in different countries were very brief by by force, you know, and I uh, <coughs> mostly uh, I met uh, journalists and uh, you know 
public to discuss some questions about Soviet Union or East European countries. Mm, and uh, uh, so far, I had no good chance to see country, countries, England or others, properly. Uh, I found some things, some points uh, that are surprising for me. For example? Uh, oh, for example, I can say, uh, living in Soviet Union, I thought, uh, I wasn't very, uh, you know, how to say, had no very much illusions about Western countries. But uh, still, I suppose that uh, Western people are more competitive, more active, uh, just because they live under capitalism, where competition is the main uh, strand of life, main source of life. And uh, now I found that they are not so competitive, they are more passive. Uh, I don't know to what side of this life I have to attribute it. Maybe you have no so much c uh, capitalism anymore. Uh, maybe you have uh, more socialism in your country than we can suspect from outside. It's another matter. I don't know. But uh, it struck, struck me as something uh, unexpected. Have you ever been a, a communist yourself? No, never been. And you don't share any of the, of the communist values, for example, that you were doubtless educated to believe in? No, I've I, I never been uh, in any favor of communist ideology. And uh, maybe if I, uh, when a young boy, uh, under 10, under 12 years, before Stalin's death, uh, I just took it for granted, and nothing else. But afterwards, and especially after Stalin's disclosure, it became quite clear for me. When did Kit describe to us, when, when did you first, when can you first remember uh, understanding that there was somewhere which worked differently from where you were being brought up? Well, it's, it's every time. I, I remember in school, boy, I was uh, a member of a young, how to name it, pioneer organization, just for children, communist organization for children. And they forced us to, how to say, to denunciate each other for the bad behavior publicly. And it was disgusting. And uh, everybody started to lie. Uh, to, you know, it was difficult for children and for friends to denunciate his friend openly and to befriend afterwards. And uh, since that age, they started to create some hypocrisy in us. And uh, that was my first, maybe, uh, how to name it, impulse reject of them. I refused to be a member of this organization. It was long ago, really. And, and you were a marked man from then? Sorry? You were a marked man from then? Well, on. I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> well, uh, I was so young then that uh, it had no any uh, consequences at all. Just some, some meetings, some scandals, some trouble with my parents, nothing else. Uh, but since then, I felt against this system. Are your family or your friends at the moment suffering because of your appearance, say, on this television program? Because uh, you are now a propagandist uh, for the other point of view inside the Soviet Union. Well, uh, I've been well inside of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, just because of it, my mother was expelled from work and my sister was expelled from her work. But now all of them, all my family, outside there in Switzerland, mm -hmm. they were expelled together with me, uh, then uh, I think they wouldn't have any troubles with Switzerland government. No, of course. We're getting on to the point that I'd like to ask Bill Buckley about, and that is that it makes us all feel good, don't you think, to take on the human rights cause. I speak of myself and my paper as much as you and your newspaper and, and the government in the Soviet Union, in, in, in the United States. Uh, it has made undoubtedly Mr. Carter feel good to espouse the human rights cause. Do we really think among ourselves that this is the right way of going about it? Are we absolutely sure, are you sure, Bill Buckley, that President Carter is really doing the right thing in raising the, the human rights issue so prominently at a time when the Soviet Union, for the moment, seems to be cutting back on the numbers of people, notably Jewish emigres, that it is allowing out of the Soviet Union? 
when you say, are we doing the right thing, I would have to, uh, I would have to ask uh, with reference to what objective? Our aim being to free as many dissidents, one, as possible, to allow well, that, as many case, people who wish to come out, to I, come I out and thirdly, to change Soviet, Soviet society. Uh, I, well, I would answer that we're doing, uh, we're, doing, we're doing better than nothing, but not as much as we, we might do. What else what, why might we do? Well, do Giscard d'Estaing, recently as last week, uh, outlined with extraordinary punctiliousness a program for the disestablishment of the Soviet Union, <laughs> uh, which he seemed to be, he, he, he spoke of as much easier to handle than, say, traffic in Paris. Uh, and, um, but he said that uh, French policy and Western policy had opted against that alternative on the grounds that to do so was um, dangerous. It might, uh, it might uh, spark uh, a, 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 a cordite of resentment, uh, which we wouldn't quite know how to handle. But he seemed to be saying that by a denial of the Soviet Union of the resources of Western uh, uh, economics and technology, the Soviet Union simply couldn't survive. I, now, I, 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 w I would find that a very attractive uh, solution, the Soviet Union defined as an aggressive ideological uh, a power uh, ruling the lives of several hundred million people uh, with an appetite to rule the lives of others. I remember when Mr. Bukowski came <coughs> out of the Soviet Union, was flown out on that Aeroflot flight. Uh, he was in Washington shortly after uh, Carter had sent his letter, his famous letter, to Sakharov. Uh, and the backwash of that letter was such that there were very, quite uh, heavy forces inside the administration at the time for Mr. Carter not, after all, to receive Mr. Bukowski. And I have to say that it was not altogether encouraging to watch the hesitations that went on before Mr. Bukowski was received in the White House. Do you think that really the whole thing is a calculation uh, I'm addressing myself to Mr. Buckley now, that the whole thing is a political calculation of Carter's, or do you think that he really is going to follow this through? And follow this through means four years of risking difficulties with the other great superpower, which has the power to, make, to wipe us all out, or possibly even eight years. Uh, in answer to your questions in the order in which you put them, A, I do believe it's sincere. B, I'm not at all certain that he will carry it on because it may very well be that running up against the international bureaucracy and those who uh, tell him that this is a serious impediment to uh, uh, the code of conduct, using Giscard's phrase, mm -hmm. that is required uh, to pursue detente, uh, he will be persuaded to let, 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 let off. But I do think that it is a genuine expression of an idealism that he thinks uh, uh, suffered from the rather uh, uh, cold attrition of the professionalism of uh, Mr. Kissinger. Let's answer your question. I remember um, being in Moscow a month or two before the swap, um, Mr. Bukowski with Korvalan, and I was a guest of the Russian government, which somebody traveling in, as I have to, unfortunately has to be. But it was, I was able to go and see um, Professor Sakharov and his wife in his flat, and he spoke a great deal of you and of a handful of five or six others um, who were suffering, uh, either simply being kept, which is bad enough, others um, who were very ill, and he was simply asking for intercession uh, that they, sh the, with the British and the American government, when I and two members of parliament who were with me got back uh, to try and get their conditions relieved. When we got, got back, the three of us, a Conservative Member of Parliament, a Labour Member of Parliament, and myself, went to see the then Foreign Secretary, Anthony Crossland, who has since died. And I came up, not with him personally, but with him and other ministers of the British government, against just this mealy-mouthed attitude that you described in Britain. You said that the British Labour politicians tend to pursue a rather clandestine course, thinking that they're doing it for the best. And I made something of a fuss about this uh, because the previous Tory government, conservative government in this country, uh, under that government, Mr. Uh, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, who was then our foreign secretary, 
threw out a hundred diplomats and went to diplomatic war, so to speak, with the Soviet Union. I was then uh, trounced, I'm afraid, defeated utterly, because the government then showed me the figures of the number of Russian dissidents and people who wished to emigrate who'd been allowed out under the conservative government, which had gone to diplomatic war with Russia, and the number who had been allowed out under successive Labour governments, with Mr. Harold Wilson notably, uh, pursuing this clandestine course. Of course, this was very upsetting for me, but it did seem to show something. Now, Henry Kissinger argues the same thing now, that he actually got more people out than are coming out now, than were coming out after the Jackson Amendment uh, in 1974. Uh, I remember vividly putting this sort of point to Sakharov myself, and he said, no, you must go on making a noise. You must make a noise. Mm -hmm. And other people that we talked to, Jewish would-be emigres, made the same point. Are you sure in your mind that that is right, when you see these figures which show that the clandestine real politicians like Kissinger and Wilson seem to get better results? Well, I am absolutely sure that the open way, uh, open politics are uh, real helpful. And this clandestine one is just a uh, lip service to us. And for one thing, I have to but say... But what about the figures? Uh, well, the figures uh, fi of higher numbers figures, coming out. Figures are very, a uh, very suggestive thing, but we have to construe how they arrived. And for the first thing, let's uh, uh, estimate the uh, so-called uh, uh, Jackson uh, Amendment uh, was never fulfilled, actually. No. That's another thing. And the Soviet side was uh, sure that it wouldn't be fulfilled, and that American firms would find some secret ways of trading by any equipment, including e e electronic, with the uh, Soviet Union. That's why they could show their hard line in response to such measures as just But demand. is what you're saying that, that maybe fewer people will come out now as a result of us ca causing a fuss? Um, but in the long run, yes, I'm sure. It, I'm sure. In the long that. run, it it would be very helpful. We, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot connect. Uh, we cannot uh, how to say. Uh, Russian side cannot uh, depend on uh, good view of Soviet side entirely. If they will link it, and if they will play like uh, Henry Kissinger tried, they. Uh, make it worse because Soviet side would try to play by their own. You know, they would try to suppress us more, to have more of a weak stand by Western country. Then our fate would be one of the instruments of Soviet politics to get electronics, to get anything. And we cannot afford it. And uh, uh, on the, quite on the contrary, when Western side Western political line, a very firm one and consistent. Uh, in the long run, Soviet side would be obliged to adjust itself to this line. Then we are more safe. And, uh, and I think it would be wrong to put it like that. that President Carter tried to undermine Soviet regime or change it, as President uh, Giscard d'Estaing told. It's completely wrong. What Mr. Carter do and did and do, actually, is just to defend uh, your own human values, to make them clear, to defend them. And I think he found uh, a really good line, a really uh, line uh, to escape what, what situation was created before him. He found a line to defend human values and human rights without creating Cold War without creating, uh, as you name it in America, Macartism spirit or so, because he applies this human rights attitude to every country, not only to Soviet or, I don't know, East European countries. Mm -hmm. He applies it to uh, Latin America, to African states, to Asia. That's, that's the only line, only basis for really fear politics. Does he really apply it to everybody? I saw a column, I think so. a column by Mr. Buckley the yeah. other day saying precisely that he wasn't applying it to everybody, um, saying that he was uh, applying it less 
uh, in some respects, less and less progressively to the Soviet Union. Uh, and Certainly not to China, has it? He hasn't applied it to China. Then and nobody's I discovered the problem of human rights in China yet. I haven't noticed him applying it to South Korea, for example. Well, I think he tried. What he is now speaking about in, in connection with this withdrawal of troops and other things, uh, we, can, uh, we have to be realistic. It couldn't be done just in one stroke. Uh, he has to find the best way of dealing with it. But I'm sure that he is quite sincere and uh, open-minded in this field. I noticed uh, during uh, your interview with uh, Mr. Buckley that you um, kept on talking about, as indeed we do in the West, about they, they in the Soviet Union. Mm. They are doing this, they are doing that, they mm. sent me to jail, they did this. Who are they? They, it's very difficult to describe because it took some authors to uh, create a whole theories to describe who are they. And uh, Gilles, uh, the book of who was the reason of my first arrest, created a full theory of new class. I cannot share it uh, completely, but it is something like that. It is a ruling class of Soviet Union, the communist and the uh, uh, state bureaucracy. That bureaucracy, is it? Um, is the KGB included in it? Yes, of course. It's an essential part of it. Or does the KGB really run it? In other words, could Mr. Brezhnev get rid of the KGB or go against the KGB, even if he wanted to? Uh, well, <coughs> uh, I, I think he, uh, Mr. Brezhnev runs KGB, not on the contrary. They can have some rubs or something like that. Uh, I don't know anything about it. But uh, I'm sure that uh, General Secretary of Communist Party is really ruler of this country, and uh, the Politburo people are really the top of this apparatus. Mr. Buckley, we've arrived at the great day, and you are President of the United States. And you're faced with a choice I'll of... give you amnesty. <laughs> <laughs> you're faced with a choice, uh, before I've committed my crime, of an arms control agreement um, of really quite some uh, substance, which does give us a feeling of security over 10 years ahead, and letting 100 dissidents out of jail. Which do you choose? Well, obviously the former. Reculer pour mieux sauter. But um, I don't think that the it former would be being the arms control agreement. Sure, I don't think it would be a question of trading something uh, uh, off. That's what the Soviet the Union wants to make it seem, though, doesn't it? Yeah, they they want to make it seem that, but uh, most of the most of their activity uh, is not persuasively put forward as an attempt to achieve uh, to achieve parity. Nobody doubts that they have tactical parity, and quite a few people believe that they have strategic uh, uh, parity, to say nothing of the other dimension, which is self-defense, which is highly developed in their country, and not at all in yours or, or, or mine. The, the um, safety of one's own people must be the paramount objective of any policy. That means but that morality is divisible. Oh, uh, well, morality is, of course, divisible. As, um, they must have taught you an ample for it. The, uh, I wasn't brought up by Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> what I say is not Jesuitical when I say that um, I think it is universally uh, acknowledged that there is such a thing as, the, as the, the better cause or the lesser evil. And uh, to, to say that the whole of the world's peace is hostage to the uh, freedom of a single person in the Lubyanka prison uh, is, uh, is excessive. But it does not answer the question whether a concern for human rights in the Soviet Union doesn't felicitously unite a, the pursuit of morality and the pursuit of a foreign policy, which does, in fact, have the effect of subverting the hegemony which is the principal threat to the world. And Mr. Bukowski, in some of his writings, has suggested that. One of the reasons, and as have others, one of the reasons that the Soviet Union cannot have human freedom is because it would be writing its own death warrant. 
and cannot have freedom also in the satellite countries which are not even part of the Soviet Union. Do you think that they, Mr. Bukowski, the Hungarys, the Czechoslovakias, do you think that uh, uh, change of the Soviet hegemony by infection through that route is a more likely uh, achievement than confrontation with the Soviet Union itself? Well, I'm afraid this didn't happen since since 50s we had uh, several several moments when east european countries tried to free themselves in hungary in 1957 56 in poland in czechoslovakia quite recently and they couldn't manage it and uh, i think the main problem lies in in moscow in soviet union you don't think that, uh, Mr. Buckley, that we're creating the situation now with the human rights campaign for a new outbreak in Czechoslovakia or Hungary, which will then lead to even further repression? Uh, I think it's always possible that any agitation that keeps alive the idea of freedom is going to stimulate the appetite for it. And one can never know the extent to which an individual is willing to risk uh, the end of his own life as Mr. Bukowski was willing against extraordinary odds to risk the end of his own life in order to press that point for freedom. Now, do we have an obligation to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, discourage the struggle for freedom in the light of our indisposition to help it concretely raises, I think, a point over which people have agonized since 1956 and our failure to come to the aid of those who rose up in Budapest, with which I am regretfully have to close the program by thanking you, Mr. Knight, and thanking especially Mr. Dmitry Bukowski. Thank you. Thank you all. Printed bound transcript of this program send one dollar to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. That's Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina 29250. This program was produced by SICA, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding was provided by this station and by other public television stations. Thank mm -hmm. you.